What is truth? You know, we kind of think we understand the term, but I, I got to say, in our postmodern society that we find ourselves living in, it's not so easy to determine what the truth is. Now, we have a definition for truth. We have a dictionary definition. I looked it up. Truth. That which is true. Well, of course. Or that which is in accordance with fact or reality. Okay, so it's fact or reality. We think now we got it, but, well, think about it. In our society, people nowadays see fact and reality through the eyes of their own emotions. And so facts and reality change according to who you're talking to. So what is truth? You know, in his book, Adrift, Postmodernism in the Church, Phil Sanders cites that 70% of Americans now believe that there is no such thing as absolute truth. Think about that. When you go out there, 7 out of 10 people think there's no such thing as truth. And this is evident often when you're talking to young people, say people thir- younger than 30 or younger than 25. So right about Jessica's age. So say hi to Jessica, everyone. She's here with us. Yeah, she, she's here to represent that age group for us today. But you talk to them often and, and you know, you get this idea of what is true and, and you'll, you'll say something that this is a fact, this is true. And they'll say, okay. And then they'll say something completely different is true. But they're all right with that. In their minds, you're both right. They're both true at the same time, even though they might contradict each other. Oh, it's all true. And, and this can be mind-boggling. It can be, it makes you feel like you're going insane having conversations w- w- with people in the world like this today. You know, I was talking to the youth once. We do our, our youth ministry over there every Thursday night. I was talking to the youth once about dinosaurs. And I was talking about dinosaurs in light of what we see about uh, what is revealed to us in the scriptures of how God created uh, the world. And I pointed out to them that a lot of the so-called truths they are taught about dinosaurs are completely different than the so-called truths I was taught about dinosaurs when I was their age. I was taught that there was such a thing as a brontosaurus, which there wasn't. It was just uh, uh, some people, they found two skeletons and kind of accidentally put them together. Brontosaurus, no such thing. But, but, you know, the facts are different. And you know what? The youth are all right with that. They just accept that the truth of today is going to be different tomorrow. There's going to be a different truth sometime in the future. But for now, what they're told is truth is good enough. Because there is no such thing as absolute truth to so many people in the world nowadays. What is truth? You know, we are not the first generation of people to face this idea of people wanting, you know, thinking, what is truth? We're confused about the truth. I think for at least 2,000 years, every generation... Every era, they've asked, what is truth? It's why we went through the Middle Ages, and then we got to the Renaissance, and then we got, within the Renaissance, the Reformation, and then we got to the Baroque period, and then the Enlightenment, and then the modern era, and the postmodern. We're all asking, what is truth? It's the question Pontius Pilate was asking when Jesus stood before him on trial. Since then, we've been asking, what is truth? And I got to tell you, you look at what's going on with Pontius Pilate in this interaction with Jesus we're looking at today, and you see it has a direct connection to how we seek truth today. They were seeking truth back then, and we're seeking truth now. So let's look at this. Let's look and see how, how this helps us in our own context find out, you know, what is truth when we ask that question. So, you know, most of us know the events that led up to Jesus being brought before Pilate on trial. Pilate being the Roman governor uh, over the area at the time. It's been a busy week for Jesus. Uh, On Sunday, he had ridden into the city of Jerusalem, the capital city, and the people hailed him as their king. Uh, We talked about it at the children's sermon. We've been waving palms all morning. We saw that. It was a good day for Jesus, but it was a busy week even after that because there were so many people in the city uh, for the Passover celebration. Jesus was out there teaching the people. And he was answering questions from the people. And he was out there answering questions from the religious leaders. Even up to the night before when he gathered with his disciples to eat the Passover feast. And while he was there, he washed their feet. He predicted his upcoming betrayal and his arrest. He predicted that by the end of the night, Peter would deny knowing him three times. He instituted the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, communion, which we we still do in the church tradition. And then he went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, and the night still wasn't over. Because while he was there, he was betrayed by his follower Judas Iscariot. And he was arrested, and he was taken to to the high priest, and before the Jewish council, and they questioned him. 
And they mocked him. And they found him to be guilty of blasphemy. Not for anything he said, but because he didn't disagree with them when they said he was the son of God. So they find him guilty of blasphemy. In the Jewish law, this is a crime punishable by death. So that's what brings Jesus before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. Because even though the Jewish leaders find him, Jesus, guilty of blasphemy... Under Roman rule, the Romans don't allow them to put anyone to death for this reason. They're not allowed. So, they have to get the sentence from the Roman governor. They have to get it from Pilate. So, they take Jesus to Pilate. And Luke tells us in his gospel that when they present Jesus to Pilate, the spiritual leaders, they kind of change the charge a little bit. They don't tell Pilate that uh, we find him guilty of blasphemy because uh, blasphemy uh, against God, Pilate's not going to care about that. He's going to say, oh, you, you weird Jews, go and do your religious stuff. Pilate's not going to care. So they tell Pilate, oh, he, he's guilty uh, of sedition. He's subverting Roman rule. He claims to be Christ, a king. He, he wants to be king, Pilate. You know that's not allowed. So, um, already, before Pilate even talks to Jesus, we have this idea, what is the truth here? The religious leaders find Jesus guilty of one thing, but Pilate's under the impression that he's guilty of something else. What is the truth? And it seems Pilate knows. Let's give Pilate some credit. He knows he's not getting the full story here. He knows the religious leaders of the Jews. They're acting a little bit suspicious. Kind of like any time you catch one of your kids acting suspicious. You, those of you who have had kids. Any time I catch the kids in my house uh, with a blanket wrapped up in a ball in front of them and they're heading upstairs, I know there's something in there they don't want me to see. Right? They got an extra snack. They got a tube of glue. They got a turtle. They got something they don't want us to see. And so I look at them and I say, what are you doing? Doing? What are you up to? And what they're always innocent, right? Oh, nothing, Uncle Mark. So what do you do? I question them because I know sooner or later they're going to say something that's going to reveal the true story of what's happening. Uh, you know, they're going to trip up. And, and, and that's kind of what we see going on with Pilate right here. You know, Matthew tells us Pilate, he know, Pilate knows that there's no real reason to charge Jesus. He knows it's just out of envy that the religious leaders of the Jews have brought Jesus to him. And so what does he do? He does what we do. He questions Jesus. He says, Jesus is this wrapped up blanket, and he's going to unwrap it and find out what's really going on here. It seems Pilate really does want to get to the bottom of what's true. So we get this interchange between Pilate and Jesus, and they're both kind of feeling each other out. And Jesus is trying to lead Pilate to really fully understanding, help Pilate understand what he himself is thinking. And, and so Pilate, he gets right to it, and Pilate says, well, Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And she's kind of like, well, is that what you think? Or did someone, someone say that to you? And then, and then Pilate, Pilate, Pilate's kind of snotty. He's like, my Jew. Look, buddy, your own people brought you to me. So won't you tell me what's going on here? And brings us back to the original question. Are you a king? Jesus pretty much looks at Pilate and he says, hey, look. If I were a king here... My servants, my soldiers, they would have fought to prevent my arrest. They would have fought to keep me from being brought here. Isn't that true? Because we, we've all seen like the medieval movies where the king's castle is under attack. And what happens? All the people uh, of the kingdom go and fight for their king. They, they lay down their lives to protect the king. But that's not what's going on here. In fact, the previous night when Jesus was arrested, some of the disciples wanted to fight. Peter pulls out a sword. And what's Jesus do? He says, put that away. Call it off. We're not doing that, Peter. So Jesus is pretty much telling Pilate here, I'm not trying to be a king here in Rome or anywhere. I'm not subvert subverting your Roman rule. But then Jesus does go on to say, my kingdom is not of this world. Now, my kingdom is from another place. And Pilate catches it. He catches the admission here. He says, ah, you are a king. God, you see, he's unwrapped the blanket and he's found oh, the king of the Jews. And then Jesus says it outright. You are right in saying I am a king. I am a king. See, the people, they had it right five days earlier when they celebrated him coming into the, to the city as a king. Is the people didn't understand that his kingdom was of another world. It wasn't about what they wanted it to be about. It was a different realm. Jesus says, yeah, I'm a king. 
Now, there's an unspoken question here from Pontius Pilate. It's not there, but you know he's thinking it. Uh, Jesus, if you're a king and you're not here to take over, why are you here? Why are you in my country, Jesus? What's going on? So, so Jesus, even though Pilate hasn't asked the question, Jesus answers it. And Jim, show us what Jesus says here. John chapter 18, verse 37. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Jesus here, he's here to testify. He's here to show and prove what the truth is. He's not here for some political reason. Truth. He came to testify to it. It seems the truth is very important to Jesus. Truth defined Jesus. Jesus defines truth. Jesus says, you want to know what truth is? Listen to me. I'm the truth. And then they get, I, I think, in my opinion, are the saddest words of this whole interchange between Jesus and Pilate. Pilate just kind of looks at Jesus and says, well, what is truth? What is truth? And it's unclear whether Pilate's sincerely contemplating, well, what is truth? Or if Pilate's just kind of spitting this in Jesus' face because he's offended by what Jesus has been saying. It's unclear. What is clear is that the truth is standing right in front of Pontius Pilate. The truth of his creation, the truth of his purpose and reason for being, the truth of his salvation, the truth of his life, it is there right in front of him. And he rejects it. It seems he's starting to get it. He's starting to understand it, but I don't know what is truth, and he just walks away. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the world's best piece of cake. Now, you know how I am about my cake, right? Imagine with me for a moment, you make your life, uh, this is what I almost did with my life, but you make your life about finding the world's best, most per perfect piece of cake that was ever made. And so you go from country to country, from city to city, from bakery to bakery, exhausting yourself, exhausting all your resources, looking for the most perfect piece of cake. And one day, you crawl into some bakery in the middle of nowhere, and there it is. The world's most perfect piece of cake. You know it is. You know the icing's going to be sweet, but it's not going to be too sweet. You know it's going to be dense and heavy, but not too dense and heavy. And you know it's going to be flavorful, and you know there are going to be lots of different flavors, but everything's going to be perfectly balanced in there, and it's going to taste so good. And it's perfectly sliced. It's perfectly put out on the plate for you, perfectly waiting for you. And the baker gives it to you and you have it. So you get your napkin all ready and you pick up your fork. And you say, ah, it's probably not worth it anyway. And you walk away. There it is! It's what you wanted your whole life. Right in front of you. But you reject it. Well, that's probably the saddest story I've ever told here, right? Someone rejecting the world's most perfect piece of cake. But that's the story of Pontius Pilate. What is truth? And he walks away. The sad thing is Pilate is not the only one to reject truth in all of this. You know, Pilate, he rejects Jesus as the truth, but he sees there's no reason to kill this guy. So he has the soldiers instead flog Jesus. The soldiers whip Jesus and they mock him. And then Pilate brings him back to, to the leaders of the Jewish people. He says, here he is, uh, take him. And the moment the leaders see Jesus though, they start shouting, crucify, crucify. Now we know crucifixion was not the normal death sentence. Crucifixion was a shameful death reserved for criminals, for rebels, uh, for slaves. Jesus was none of those things. And Pilate knows it. And so did the religious leaders. But so deep was their hatred of Jesus that they demand crucifixion. Their demand for crucifixion proves they hate Jesus. See, they didn't just reject the truth. They hated the truth. They hated Jesus. Because Jesus is the truth. You see, the very evening before this, while he was eating the Passover with his disciples, Jesus said, John 14, 6, many of us know this, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through, through me. Jesus is the truth. The truth is Jesus. The only way to the Father, the only way to heaven where the Father resides is through the truth, through Jesus. Jesus made it clear. 
you know, our society wrestles with this question, what is truth? And it's not because people are incapable of understanding truth. You know, the, the reason that so many are lulled into this sense of truth of being interchangeable or subjective, it isn't because they can't understand. It's not because they can't grasp that there is truth. It's because, like Pilate, they reject truth. Or maybe they're like the religious leaders, and they hate truth. See, people reject or hate the truth. They reject or hate Jesus because it's offensive. Jesus, he's offensive. He comes into this world testifying the truth. Hey, you're a sinner. You are depraved. You are offensive to God. You are not right. You are not wise. You are not perfect at all. And left up to your own self, there's nothing you can do about it. That's offensive. That's Jesus as the truth. The truth Jesus testifies to. And that's a hard pill for so many people to swallow. Especially in this American society where we think we're better, we're smarter than everybody else in the world. Or in this society where we think we're good enough if we just help a few people or if we back the right political cause. The truth of Jesus is offensive. And so like maybe Pilate, people reject the truth. People reject Jesus. Maybe like the religious leaders, people reject the truth or they, they, they hate the truth. They hate Jesus. Almost 2,000 years ago, Jesus was crucified because people rejected and hated the truth. People still reject and hate the truth today. People still reject and hate Jesus today. Same story, different setting. So people, they're left in the world. They're left in this world without any truth. Though they desperately want truth, they search their whole lives for truth. What is the meaning? What's the truth of it all? Oh, how people thirst for truth and the peace it brings. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have this truth. Jesus is the truth. You've got it in your life. The question is, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do with the truth? You see, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they crucified Jesus. They silenced Jesus. They silenced the truth. Are you too going to silence the truth? Or will you proclaim it? That's the question. The people of today, they're not like Pontius Pilate. They don't have truth standing right in front of them. Jesus is not standing right in front of them as a follower of Jesus. That's part of, the, of your, your role. That's what you do. You present Jesus to the people. You work to do that, to reveal the truth to those who don't understand it. To speak and to live truth so people can hear it. So people can see it. And when you do, sure, people might reject it. They may even hate it. They may be offended by it. Offended by this idea that they are sinners and they need Jesus to save them. But when they do, if they reject the truth or hate the truth, what they do with it is between them and God. That's not up to you. It's not your problem. You, you're not asking what is truth. You follow Jesus, you have the truth. You know it, so go proclaim it. When was the last time you proclaimed the truth of Jesus to anybody? Most of us, we don't have a good answer to that question. Next week, we all know, next week is Easter. Yeah, we're getting ready to celebrate Easter. Are we going to have our usual crowd? Are we going to pack the place? I say we pack the place by way of encouraging you to go out and proclaim the truth. I want to challenge every single one of you who is here today to go and invite someone to worship with us next Sunday for Easter. Someone who would not usually be in church. Now, you want to invite other people who usually go to church elsewhere and they come and worship with us? Wonderful. But invite someone who doesn't usually come to church. Tell them, hey, it's a special day. Everyone knows it's a special day. People know it's Easter. Let them know, I want to celebrate it with you. Come with me. And maybe when you make that invitation, it becomes a greater opportunity to share more of the truth of who Jesus is. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe they don't even come with you. But don't be silent. Don't silence the truth. 2,000 years ago, men hated the truth, and so they silenced it. And our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. 
as a follower of Jesus, you have the truth. So go proclaim it. Proclaim it that those who don't understand the truth understand that Jesus' crucifixion, it came with a purpose. Jesus died for me. He died for you. He died for them. That's the truth. Go proclaim it that it might be known. Let's pray.